This video is sponsored by Squarespace. We finally did it, boys. Pixar is a computer animated film company that make movies for little, little babies, right? Wrong! Pixar is arguably one of the greatest production companies to ever exist. What they did in the 15 years between 1995 and 2010 is unheard of in cinematic history. For a company to make one iconic film is incredibly difficult. But to consistently chain produce them almost sounds like a fucking joke. However, in the last eight years, we've been going to the cinema expecting the creative ambition that we associate with Pixar, only to be met with diluted subpar sequels and mediocre original films. These are good kids' films and competent enough, but when framed against the iconic films that made us fall in love with Pixar, you can see that their legacy is slowly fading with each new release, making us wonder, is Pixar dead? This man is John Lasseter. He studied animation under some of the most influential classic Disney animators. He was a star student winning awards for his short films. But after finishing the course, what really interested him was computer-generated animation. For the next 10 years, Lasseter built up a company with one key goal, to make the first fully CGI film. Eventually, Disney gave him his opportunity when he pitched Toy Story. However, Disney weren't confident with Pixar and sent them copious notes. Pixar were keen to please and Toy Story slowly changed into something entirely different to what Lasseter originally imagined. After several months, Toy Story's pre-production was finalized, the script was done and each shot storyboarded. Pixar showed what they had to Disney, who hated it, and instantly stopped production of the film. Lasseter knew this was his only chance to achieve his lifelong dream, so him and his team completely rewrote and re-storyboarded the film from scratch in two weeks. Against all odds, Disney greenlit the production. If you're in your 20s, you probably grew up with this film and have a deep emotional connection to every intricate aspect of it. It's the first CGI film ever made, which is commendable on its own merit, but it's also maintained its importance to to this day, being a film that is still discussed and enjoyed. This is because of its powerful use of storytelling and character writing. Needless to say, Toy Story was a huge hit, being the highest grossing film of that year. After Toy Story, Lasseter went straight into directing the next film. Can you imagine the pressure of having to make Pixar's second feature film? The second feature film of your career? After making fucking Toy Story! But Pixar pushed forward and released A Bug's Life, the fourth highest grossing film of that year, further cementing Pixar as a box office powerhouse. Due to the technology available at the time, Lasseter was told they could only have a maximum of 50 ants in one shot. Lasseter pushed his team and brought that number up up to 431. They seem to relish the idea at Pixar of doing something difficult. If that doesn't scream ambition for changing the game, then I don't know what does. A secondary production team at Pixar had been working on a low budget straight to video sequel to Toy Story. But after the success of A Bug's Life, Disney had dollar signs in their eyes and pushed for a cinematic release. The only problem, it wasn't very good. This caused the first schism between Disney and Pixar. Disney thought it was good enough for a theatrical release, whereas Pixar had higher artistic standards and didn't want to release a movie that was just okay. Disney also wouldn't budge on the release date, refusing to allow them to redo the film. Lasseter canceled his holiday and completely remade the film in nine months. And boom, another classic. The fact that this film was made in nine months has me suspicious that Lasseter made some kind of deal with the devil. What a freak. Lasseter takes a well-deserved break, giving Pete Docter, a man who wrote on the Toy Story films and had directed a few short films, the responsibility of writing and directing Pixar's fourth feature film. He gets complete creative freedom to make any film he wants, and he makes Monsters, Inc. A film so tightly written, so original, so ambitious, so heartbreaking, that I think there is a genuine argument for it being as good as Shawshank Redemption. Monsters, Inc. a directorial debut broke the box office record for the highest grossing animated film ever, if you don't count Lion King. Which I don't, because it ripped off Shakespeare, word for word. I eat the air, promise cram. Next, the director's chair went to Andrew Stanton, another first-time director who was told he could make anything he wanted. He had the pressure of releasing the fifth Pixar film, one year after Monsters, Inc. And he makes... Finding Nemo! To say that Stanton pushed his animation team beyond its limits is an understatement. Without meaning to, I sort of made this epic journey that takes you all over the ocean. That meant every set piece had to be different. 
the look of being underwater is actually quite simple from a technical standpoint. It was just really tough to dial all the different ingredients just right. You know, I think if I'd known that's what I was going to be signing up for and everybody else, I don't think anybody would have done it. <laughs> he moved away from the Randy Newman composed happy-go-lucky charm of the previous Pixar installments to deliver an intimate, ambient, grounded masterpiece. Finding Nemo managed to somehow outgross Monsters, Inc. Next, Lasseter brought in an old-school chum of his, Brad Bird, who had never even touched a Pixar film. Any company that had four hits in a row would not be open to changing anything. This place was the exact opposite. They were saying, look, we've had four hits in a row. We are in danger of repeating ourselves or of getting too satisfied, and we need to shake this place up. So Brad Bird comes out with The Good Dinosaur, and it's a huge hit and massively iconic. JK, it's The Incredibles. Could you imagine if it was The Good Dinosaur? So all six Pixar films up to this point have received critical acclaim and killed the box office. Pretty bloody outstanding. If you can name any other production company that have made this many consecutive hits without fuck ups, I'll give you my car keys. Did someone say fuck ups? Did someone say car keys? It's car... Fuck. Yeah, okay, I'll admit, cars will always be the black sheep of Pixar. I fully put the blame on John Lasseter being overly confident and just seeming to generally like cars quite a lot. I can understand why small children are really into it, but it's so generic and lazy in places. I'm dying to know how this car managed to frame and put up this picture without the assistance of thumbs. Just because the bugs are cars doesn't mean your world is fought through. It just means you made everything a car. It was during this time that Pixar and Disney's partnership was in major conflict. Disney wanted to push Pixar into making sequels. However, making sequels to Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo and The Incredibles was not something Pixar ever intended or were keen to do. This was something they were fighting tooth and nail for, even reaching out to alternative distributors in order to protect their IPs. Disney eventually agreed to leave their damn films alone, and outright bought Pixar, but allowed them to maintain their independence. Which now, in hindsight, it seems as though Disney were playing some kind of sinister long game with Pixar. The three directors behind Pixar's highest grossing films each made a second film under Pixar. Ratatouille, Wally, and Up. Re-establishing Pixar's momentum for powerful filmmaking, unique worlds, and original storytelling. These films are all iconic in my opinion, and no childhood would be complete without the inclusion of these classics. However, at the time, these films weren't enough to be Ice Age Shrek or Kung Fu Panda in the box office. So a decision was made, and despite Pixar's earlier rebuttals, Toy Story 3 was released 15 years after the original, becoming the highest grossing animated film ever, finally beating The Lion King. But at what cost? A member movie is a sequel to a culturally popular film made over a decade after the original. The primary application of creative resources is spent on recapturing the energy and momentum of the original. There isn't a desire for establishing new elements or deepening the world. Instead, the desire is to get the viewer to say, Oh, I remember that. Allowing them to relive that same fluffy feeling they experienced the first time when they were fresh-faced and innocent. No one goes to see these films because it looks like it's offering a new, exciting story. They go solely off the back of their experience with the previous, more effective original. Producers are fully aware of this and shove in as many callbacks and references as possible. Every time a new member movie is announced, it leaves the question, why are they making the sequel now? Why didn't they make it immediately after the original? The answer is usually because they didn't think they needed to make one. This suggests that the member movie is being made purely for financial gain or to satisfy the egos of the original creators. The sole intention of selling our own nostalgia back to us. All this being said, it did make sense for Toy Story 3 to be made 15 years after the first. The passage of time is used in the narrative to show a now grown up Andy who no longer plays with toys. The original audience of children who fell in love with the first two films have now grown up along with Andy. His nostalgia and love for the toys are mirrored in the audience. As a result of this, it's hard to see this film is forced or artificial. But despite this, Toy Story 3 is still a member movie. At the end of the first film, Buzz has learned the value of being a toy and Woody has learned the pettiness of jealousy. The friendship that forms with Woody and Buzz feels earned and satisfying. At the end of Toy Story 2, Woody has learned about his backstory and has accepted that his relationship with Andy can't last forever. Buzz has reaffirmed the value of being a toy back onto Woody and has rescued his friend. This builds to an epilogue that is again earned. With Toy Story 3, the toy's dynamics and their look on the world is exactly the same. They're now in a different room and are being played with again, but aside from that, 
everything is unchanged. The film retreads the same themes as the second one, that toys don't last forever, and that children sometimes grow up, no longer having a need for toys, except it doesn't have a character arc. It introduces some fun and interesting characters, but when stripping away the image of your childhood toys being together again, it's a weak sequel. But obviously, we all went to see Toy Story 3 and we were all happy to see it, because you'd have to be a cold-blooded, cynical arsehole not to. Disney's constant push for sequels had been affirmed by the huge amount of ticket sales. The member movie became the foundation of Pixar's business model. The change in philosophy at Pixar can easily be observed when looking at the 20 films in their filmography. With the first 10 films, there's one sequel made out of necessity, with the last 10, six of them are sequels. It's worth noting that ironically, even though they're trash, the Cars movies aren't member movies. Each new instalment is different, with a new direction for the genre and characters. They're not marketing the film solely on images and characters from the original, since no one ever cared about Cars anyway. Sadly, the same can't be said for Monsters University. Straight off the bat, Pete Doctor, the man responsible for writing and directing Monsters, Inc. has absolutely nothing to do with Monsters University. You'd think he'd want to ensure that his characters and world would be handled with care. It is a major red flag that he didn't even want to work on the script. Monsters University uses imagery from Monsters, Inc., but immediately you get a sense of how diluted and lazy it is. With the original, there's a real sense of diversity in the monsters' designs in terms of size, texture, and abilities. We see how the world adapts and exists to accommodate this huge variety with different sized doors for Mike and Sully, small houses for small monsters. There's also a lot of thought put into the design of all the small elements that make up the world. Look at the weird fruits there. Ooh. And that phone, it isn't a human phone. Everything has a slight monstrous quality to it, with spikes and evil eyes galore. In pale contrast, when we look at the design that went into Monsters University, you can see that there is no thought put into how the space exists for the monsters. The bus is just a normal grey metal bus with normal average seats made to accommodate equally normal average looking monsters. The university looks like a beautiful place of inspiration and learning with no monstrous qualities at all. When you're making an animated film, this is the first thing to get right. But every visual aspect feels like it was created with the same amount of enthusiasm as cars. How did they hang up the pictures? How did they hang up the pictures? I could have easily overlooked this aspect if Monsters University offered us a story that actually gave us something interesting. But this narrative is what feels like the least inspired or interesting story that could be told in a university or educational setting. How many times have we seen that movie where a group of students need to work through a series of high stakes challenges for some derivative reason and through doing so learn valuable lessons like self-worth, teamwork, and that you can do more than what is expected of you. But hey, at least you got to see how Mike Wazowski developed his workout regimen for Sully. Remember when he did that in the first one? Also, do you remember those fruits I mentioned in the first one? Oh yeah, in the quirky restaurant setting. That was fun, wasn't it? Well, in Monsters University, they just eat trash. Which is what this film is, except it probably doesn't taste as nice. Speaking of living in the shadow of great films, here's Finding Dory. If there was ever a perfect example of a film that didn't need to exist, it would be Finding Dory. Finding Dory is directed by Andrew Stanton, who directed Finding Nemo. It's set one year after the original, but is made 13 years after. Can you imagine Andrew Stanton applying the finishing touches to Wally and thinking, yeah, this is fine, but what I'm really excited to do is just jump right into Finding Dory. In Finding Nemo, we are shown the importance of Nemo to Marlin in the opening sequence. Then, when he does get taken, we are emotionally invested, and the lengths that Marlin goes on to save him is completely justified. With Finding Dory, the inciting incident is a flashback that Dory gets out of nowhere. The flashback communicates that Dory's parents are really nice, and that she loves them. That's it. Why is it important for her to find them? What's at stake if she doesn't? Dory's quite happy and comfortable without them, as it is clearly shown. Dory is nice, and her parents are nice. But aside from that, why do we care if she finds them? The film's foundations are built on this, and it feels inherently weak. 
But what solidifies this film as a member movie is that they just entirely retread the same character arc of the first one. Marlin once again doesn't trust Dory and once again criticizes Dory on her judgment. A large amount of time is spent establishing the idea that Marlin needs to trust Dory. In the end, Marlin does learn to trust her, but maybe he's the fish that has memory problems because this is exactly the same as what happens in Finding Nemo. In the original, we see Marlin being unable to trust Nemo at the start. You think you can do these things, but you just can't, Nemo! Not willing to allow him to make decisions for himself. After he gets taken away, he meets Dory and treats her in a similar way. This leads to him not trusting her when she tells him to swim through the trench rather than over it. Marlin sees the consequences of his actions and feels remorse and guilt for not trusting her. After this, he sees his attitude towards Dory as a reflection of how he sees Nemo. You think you can do these things, but you can't, Nemo! He takes a leap of fate and trusts Dory and it pays off. This leads to an emotionally satisfying ending, where we see how Marlin's relationship with Dory has had a direct effect on the relationship with his son. In Finding Dory, we see a ham-fisted version of the same lesson. However, trusting Dory seems like a bad idea in Finding Dory, as she's often fucking up and putting other characters in dangerous situations. She finds her parents due to blind luck rather than using any kind of skills. The conclusion of the narrative doesn't feel earned and is unsatisfying, but hey, Remember the turtles? Ultimately, I'm not saying that these films are terrible. They aren't objectively bad. Nevertheless, Pixar has proven to us so many times that it has limitless creativity in what it can achieve. The moment you hold these member movies against that standard, you see that so little ambition has been put into these films. They hardly achieve their goal in even recreating what the originals offer, let alone establishing anything new. Although they have done well at the box office, I find it difficult to believe that they are going to be remembered with fondness or warmth. Don't believe me? Name any of these characters. This is the exact sort of short-term sequel shilling that Pixar fought against all those years ago. It makes me sick to my stomach to imagine finding Marlin, Monster's Holiday, or Ratatouille. But at least they still make original films, and they're good, right? Out of the last 10 Pixar films, four of them have been original, but we all know nobody counts Brave and The Good Dinosaur. Brave was seen as a disappointment. Despite looking pretty and having a nice sounding soundtrack, its commitment to a conventional narrative and the focus on a mother-daughter relationship without nuance or believability makes it purely mediocre. It's a good film to stick on to distract your six-year-old kid who won't shut the fuck up, but they'd still probably rather watch Toy Story. With The Good Dinosaur, did you actually see it? I swear nobody actually saw this film, and for good reason. It's exactly what you think it is. It started off as an interesting concept, but its release kept getting pushed back due to the higher up executives not being happy with the story. It got to a point where the original mind behind the project was either fired or left in exasperation, leaving a confused mess of a film that nobody wanted to see. Pixar's first flop ever in history. So now, we just have Inside Out and Coco. Out of the second half of Pixar's filmography, this is all we have left. Inside Out, which is directed by Pete Docter, felt like it could have been a really fun idea that could have taken advantage of all the creative possibilities of having a film predominantly set in someone's head. It's disappointing when everything in this film is painfully practical and literal. The only aspects to Riley's brain that is present in the film is simply out there out of story necessity, leaving a thinly constructed world that is entirely surface level. When you imagine Inside Out, what comes to mind is the image of unending corridors filled with stored memories or the equally plain headquarters space. The waiting room at my dentist is a more interesting location than the inside of Riley's mind. Think of all the different characters and props that are used in the world building of other Pixar films. Then you've got the headquarters space and inside out. Oh look, there's colourful bright balls that represent memories. Oh look, they grab a light bulb if they have an idea. Um, books? Oh, they go to bed at one point. Would have been interesting to see what the different bedrooms actually look like. Most general audience films will follow a structure where one or more characters go on a journey in order to achieve a goal, traveling a great distance and going through hardship to achieve that goal. An essential part to this journey is understanding where each area is located in relation to the others, so we can understand how challenging and strenuous it is on our protagonists. With Inside Out, the world design is so poorly put together that it's near impossible to map out the various locations. It feels like a dome-shaped children's play area. They always seem to end up in this bit right here. 
There is an urgency for Joy and Saad to get back to headquarters, but it's hard to feel tension as their journey towards headquarters isn't linear, and is mostly just Joy fucking around with different ideas. Pete Doctor is a skilled director with a knack for visual storytelling. He received a lot of acclaim and praise for the opening sequence in his film Up, but let's compare this opening sequence with the one from Inside Out, which is a basic voiceover that tells the audience everything they need to know. I mean, it's easy and it explains everything nicely to the kids, but this tell rather than show mentality is there throughout the whole film. Every time we enter a new part of the brain, someone announces exactly what it is, rather than showing it functioning, visually showing us a sense of how it works. The point is, the islands of personality are what make Riley, Riley. Where are we? Long-term memory? What is this place? The subconscious. It's clear to me that Doctor's flair for visual storytelling has been snubbed out either by a lack of vigor or Disney or both. This very practical and minimal approach also regrettably carries over into the characters and not just the ones that are solely communicating one basic emotion, all of them. Ultimately, Inside Out does manage to bring it all together with a strong final act, which finally establishes the elements of nuance that are absent from the rest of the film. But that doesn't overlook the fact that it comes at the end of two thirds of a basic stripped back and uninspired story. All right, next let's kill Coco. Look, I understand why you like Coco. I understand why you'd like any of these films. Like I said, they're competent and are great for little, little babies. But at its core, Coco is a film about someone who has a deep passion for an art form but isn't allowed to pursue it due to his family wanting him to be like them, leading to a conflict which triggers the second act and a resolution that leads to the family accepting that. Ratatouille has an incredibly similar narrative structure. Remy wants to cook, but his family disapprove and want him to stay in the, um, rat herd. But there are so many layers on top of that. You've got the relationship between Remy and Linguini, the antagonistic head chef and food critic, and the romance between Colette and Linguini. It has that narrative arc of Remy being allowed to pursue his passion, but also has these stubborn larger-than-life characters also change and learn in that same space. The issue with Coco is it follows a weaker, blander version of this. Every character has one single motivation that they are constantly repeating over and over again. Miguel wants to play music, his skeleton sidekick wants to be remembered, and his ancestors want Miguel to be home. These motivations never change. There isn't any explorations of greys, and this topped with an overly melodramatic villain who's willing to murder children to achieve his goals makes the film lack any believability or realism. It's outstanding to me that a film with talk fish or anthropomorphic toys is able to relay genuine character changes better than Coco. Miguel's family are aggressively against Miguel being a musician, despite that being the only thing that makes him a character. They're against music because his great-great-grandfather was a musician and he walked out on his great-great-grandmother and never came back. This is a really dumb reason to hate music, and it might be easier to understand that outlook if this information wasn't delivered as a voiceover with simplistic imagery. Maybe if we visually saw the hatred of music being passed down through the generations, it would make it easier to just blindly accept that the sight of a family member holding a guitar would trigger a shit fit. It's further confusing that Coco, Miguel's great-grandmother, clearly is still affectionate towards her father and seems to enjoy music. I get that she's senile and her brain's deteriorated at this point, but why the fuck would she keep a photo of her father if everyone's supposed to hate him? What about the people who are married into the family? One of Miguel's parents presumably wasn't raised under this intense music hate fascist regime unless they're like cousins oh yeah I also forgot to mention the day of the dead location which mostly acts as a pretty place for Miguel to run in it doesn't really tie very strongly into the themes nor does the world seem to function in a way that is very different from the human one it's just a bunch of skeleton people chilling out it never feels as if Miguel's in any actual danger, as he has all his ancestors following him who keep bailing him out of any majorly threatening situations. And other than that, it didn't seem like there was any real explorations of ideas of dealing with loss or regret or isolation or leaving an impact on the world. It doesn't even really explore Miguel's relationship with his ancestors, as the whole place just feels like an overly colourful backdrop to a story which could have just as easily been set in the real world. You might say that fine combing for a film which is made for the entertainment of little, little babies with this level of scrutiny is unfair. But the fact of the matter is that if you apply the same level of scrutiny to Monsters Inc, Finding Nemo or Incredibles, it all holds up. 
Character choices and motivations all make sense. Every specific element which is important to these films' narratives is given the time they need in order for you to become invested. And you definitely can't say the same with something as meek as Coco. If you're watching this, you're probably not a little, little baby. You are someone with a brain that's interested in picking apart and analyzing films. If you truly believe that Pixar only make films for little children, then you wouldn't be watching this video. Pixar's earned a huge fan base with high expectations, founded on the fact that their films can be enjoyed by people of all ages. It's up to them to maintain that legacy that they themselves built. The through line with everything that Pixar has been doing in its recent films is that none of them are taking risks. Before Toy Story 3, every film which they made was taking some sort of risk. With Bugs Life, animating 431 ants at once wasn't easy, but they did it anyway. With Toy Story 2, they could have easily just said fuck it and released something subpar, but they refused and pushed themselves by making it in nine months. With Wally, -E, having a protagonist that can only say a handful of words was immensely difficult and challenging for them. Having a strong environmental message was a risk. What are the risks that Finding Dory takes? What about Coco? And now The Incredibles 2 is out in the UK. I haven't seen it yet, but I already know that it's going to be a passive, uninteresting experience which achieves nothing new. So is Pixar dead? No, not yet, but it is dying. With every uninspired release, orchestrated specifically to drain our pockets and sell merchandise, the spark, which was so strong eight years ago, is slowly dying out. Pixar no longer ignites that same level of sincere and delicate storytelling, and instead skirts on by with just good enough. And I know for a fact that Pixar is better than that. But what do you think? Let me know down below and make sure to like and subscribe for more nitpicks content and check out my Twitter to find out what this mysterious image is. And if this video was something you enjoyed, then you have Squarespace to thank since they have brought it to you. Ever thought about making a website but been put off because the process seems strenuous and complicated? Well, Squarespace takes away those concerns. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform which offers easy to use and customizable templates, allowing you to construct the website that's perfectly suited to you. There's nothing to to install, patch or upgrade ever. And with award-winning 24-7 customer service, you know you're in safe hands. Don't be a square, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash nitpicks to save 10% of your first purchase. Thanks.